Welcome back to yet another Journal Club. Uh, we've had uh, just coming back from, well, not just coming back, but we had our sixth annual ending age-related disease conference and things were a little pushed, pushed around. So we're having our Journal Club right now, the first week of September rather than the end of August. Um, unless we had one last month and my mind is a blank, I don't think we did. Um, no. So we're having it now, and uh, we'll figure it out later whether we're going to have another one later this month or we're going to have it in the first week of October. Are we going to have a, a double this month, Steve? Uh, we're going to have a double uh, a double helping. Um, oh my we're God. A little, we're, we are, I'm afraid. I'm a stickler for having the right things in the right month. Yeah. We are a little bit delayed this time because of um, we, we did a, a conference not so long ago in New York, and I think everybody was a little bit uh, a little bit burned out after that, so we had a couple of weeks break. So we're a little bit late. It's a bit metaphysical, but this is August <laughs> Journal Club in September. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, and we have a have a new paper, a cool paper out right now. We always have a cool paper. Uh, most of them are pretty cool, but this one here, you've you've heard about some of these critters. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about. Well, we're going to be talking about rodents, but we're going to be talking about specifically naked mole rats um, just in the context of one particular gene and um, what they can offer to other mammalian species in this paper mice uh, i think c57 black six mice um, but also tantalizingly perhaps to us humans um, so what is a naked mole rat um, i don't have a picture of one you can google it um, it might frighten you um, they're little feisty critters. Um, they kind of look like a boiled hot dog with teeth. Uh, and I'm going to leave it at that. You can, you can come up with your, your own analogies as to what they look like. Um, but Dr. Vera Gorbanova works with them um, famously. And this paper here, I believe, she's, I believe she's on it, along with, I believe, Vadim Gladyshev and a number of other researchers. Um, share my screen. So I don't guess who's, who's on this paper. Um, Steve Horvath. Andre Selyanov, um, and this is Zhang et al. paper, um, increased hyaluronin, hyaluronic acid, right, um, by naked mole rat has to improves health span in mice. Um, they said health span, but it actually improves lifespan as well. And has to is an enzyme. It's uh, it's the so specifically they're using the NMR has to gene, the naked mole rat hyaluronic acid synthase 2 gene um, and one of the kind of contributors as to the extreme longevity of naked mole rats so let me back up a little bit as to why people work with these in case you haven't heard about it they're exceptionally long-lived um, and according to this first sentence here in the abstract they're the longest lived rodent um, I think 40 plus years. I don't, I don't know what the maximal maximal lifespan is but if you take a similar rodent that's about the same size living on the ground, uh, a mouse, it's going to live probably like 20 X shorter, right? So like basically like two plus years versus 40 plus years for the naked mole rat. Um, and evolutionarily that's attributed perhaps to its environment, right? Because it's, uh, it's, uh, burrows tunnels underground. So it's away from predators, right? So, um, like bats, which are also similarly small rodents, uh, they tend to live long because they can outplay their competitors according to the evolutionary theories of aging. So um, you can delay, um, you know, you could evolve genes that delay aging as a consequence. So what they're looking at here is one of these genes that might be responsible for this long livedness. And it was noticed that um, these critters have what are what's known as high molecular mass hyaluronic acid. Um, I don't have a picture of hyaluronic acid. It's a, um, uh, I think it's N-glucosamine. It's these um, uh, particular carbohydrate chains that are very long. Um, they're attached to a number of other um, another another a number of other molecules, and they form these sort of gel-like matrices um, within the extracellular matrix of um, your body. So everybody has hyaluronic uh, acid. Um, and basically there's two functions to it. One is that it provides mechanical strength and you know stability in joints, so it basically cushions them. Um, but it also acts as a signaling molecule and can hold on to a variety indirectly also um, other signaling molecules and, and release them. So um, it's very important for um, intracellular signaling. 
right? Um, and there's long, there's different different sizes of hyaluronic acid. Uh, so you can have oligomers to things that are in the you know six plus megadalton range, which is the high molecular mass hyaluronic acid. And it turns out that naked mole rats produce a lot of this stuff, and this seems to contribute to um, their exceptional longevity and their anti-cancer ability. So one one thing about cancer is a number of things go wrong, but cells need to migrate from one spot to another. So um, uh, you know, via metastases. So they do this by breaking down the ECM and hyaluronic, high molecular mass hyaluronic acid (HMMHA) um, basically uh, promotes you know prevents this metastases from happening. Uh, it uh, influences what's known as contact inhibition. So when the cells are in the presence of this high molecular mass hyaluronic acid, they don't seem to pile up on one another. So they they, they limit their movements. Um, and this paper goes on to show that uh, it's this it's this feature of HMMHA which uh, has all of these beneficial effects. So um, we all have. So I have this one question here. So they take this gene, which is hyaluronic acid synthase 2, and they transfer it to mice and from naked mole rats, and we see what happens. So that's the basis of the paper. Um, I'm not quite certain. Maybe somebody here you know, knows a little bit about this gene, but I'm not quite certain as to what's so special about naked mole rat hyaluronic acid synthase 2. Um, is, it, is it a... Um, because we do have synthes synthesis as well, this this class of genes in our bodies and, and mice do as well. Um, the author, you know, is the naked mole rat hyaluronic acid synthase 2 gene just more efficient at synthesizing longer chains? Does it have a higher processivity, so to speak? Um, is it basically just have a, you know, better kinetics at synthesis? Uh, because the authors also mentioned that there, there are also enzymes so there's a yin and yang, hyronidases, right? So enzymes that break down hyronic acid. Um, and I'm not sure if, um, I'm not sure if our tissues as well as mice have more of these enzymes that break down hyronidases um, versus maybe not producing enough of this um, naked, well, this HAS2 gene, right, which synthesizes. So um, I'm going to leave it at that if anybody wants to comment on that. I guess there's no hyaluronic acid expert in the audience here. Well, well, I do know that the naked mole rat um, does have a longer chain hyaluronic acid mm -hmm. than mice, for example. And I'm assuming it has something to do with this enzyme that creates it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, so I'm assuming that as well. Um, I'm just um, I'm just wondering. So it says uh, the hyaluronic content content is determined by the balance of hyaluronic synthesis and degradation. Um, so there's a balance. Um, they don't they don't touch on they don't work on the enzymes in this paper. The the hyaluronidases which break down. Um, but they show that that break down the hyaluronic acid. But they mentioned in the text here that naked mole rat tissues also show lower activity of hyaluronidases, um, as well as higher activity of this um, uh, HA2 gene, which builds them up. Um, so maybe that's something to look into a future paper is to see if we can knock down these hyaluronidases because they do mention that um, these hyaluronidases may be more active in in mice. And maybe in humans, so that might be, it might be another way of looking at this. Um, just tossing that out there. Um, but anyway, they get good effects here from just uh, expressing this gene. So what do they do? They make transgenic mice. So they use this ubiquitous CAG promoter, which I guess is expressed in every tissue. Um, they mentioned that high molecular mass HA accumulates postnatally, so you know it's not compatible with rapid cell proliferation during embryogenesis, um, as to be expected if this stuff inhibits cell cell division and cell growth somehow. Um, so they make these transgenic mice, which are inducible by tamoxifen. Um, this is Figure 1A. 
um, they cross these mice and they end up having um, a control mouse, which basically is just uh, is capable of expressing a Cree recombinase um, under the induction of tamoxifen and a heterozygote mice, which basically has the system along with this um, is basically this uh, this area that's removed by the recombinase, which allows this promoter to function and express um, at a suitable age. And I believe they do this, induce this at three months of age, right? So they have an inducible system for these mice. Um, so that's good. So they have a very, very good control. They have the same genetic background, you know, almost every, everything identical except, except without the um, NMR HAS2 gene, right? So they can, they can, you know, um, have a very apples to apples uh, C57 black six there was a 26 Cree ER comparison so what do they find and I apologize for the sirens in the background I'm I'm in New York City so there's always some drama taking place out there let that pass Maybe in the future I'll, I'll have a sound studio available to me, but don't have that right now. Um, okay, so figure one, what do they show? Transgenic mice overexpressing NMR HAS2 are resistant to both spontaneous and induced cancer. Um, so they're looking at expression. So this HAABP, I believe it's antibodies against hyaluronic acid, um, or a, a protein that binds to it. So it's basically used as staining. Um, so first they're looking at expression um, and they look at muscle cross sections, heart, kidney, intestine, uh, and they do a uh, pulse field electrophoresis because this stuff is really big, this, this, chem this you know, hyaluronic acid um, in the mega Dalton range. Uh, so this is the expression of the hyaluronic acid they have ladders here to show different sizes, muscle heart. So Cre ER is the control. NMR HAS2 is your, you know, expressing high levels of um, high, high molecular mass hyaluronic acid. And they also have minus plus, and that just means they add in enzymes, these hyaluronidases to show that this is specific for, because I think this is a, a this might be, um, I don't know what they're staining this with. Um, take a look in there but anyway these high, they add in an enzyme that shows that since it's broken down in this plus column that it is actually hyaluronic acid that they're staining here um, so what do we see here um, so Cre ER is control so we have a lot lot more expression of hyaluronic acid um, in muscle uh, also we have higher expression a higher molecular mass expression in the heart so this is shifted upwards here uh, same with the kidney, more in the intestine. They do mention that a lot of it seems to be smaller mass because it, you know, mice tend to have higher levels of these hyaluronidases that I mentioned. So that might be something worth looking in, in future studies to see if you can get even better effects by knocking down these hyaluronidases as well as overexpressing um, the HA2 gene. Um, I think there's more of the same in this figure as well. So. What they note in the paper is that um, that most of these tissues have high expression except for, I believe, kidney, and, no, sorry, uh, spleen and liver, um, because I think they mentioned that there's a lot more hyaluronidase activity in those organs somewhere in the text. So relative mean intensity, so this is, I believe, figure B quantized to some extent, showing that you have, um, um, it's interesting they say that's not significant in the heart. It looks like maybe the total levels are not, oh wait, no, sorry, this is expression. Well, actually, you're staining here. You would think that, yeah. well, it definitely looks in this gel that there's much more certainly shifted towards high molecular mass in the heart. So I'll take that as a plus. But looking at these, looking at these, um, uh, I think these are immunohistochemistry blots. Uh, doesn't seem to be a significant puncte in the heart, but much more in the muscle, significantly more in the kidney as well, and the intestine. So you have generally greater expression of, of these, of um, hyaluronic acid and shifted towards the high molecular mass. 
Um, they look at old mice and young mice, and they show that um, I don't really see any error bars here, but I'm going to assume these p-values are correct, that you have a percentage of mice with cancer. Old mice, they mentioned how old they are somewhere here, um, that they have less tumor incidences, and they do this assay, this skin assay, where they basically put these nasty benzene-like derivative compounds on the skin um, and add some other factor that promotes growth. So it's, it's, it's um, I looked it up, it's, it's a very kind of standard, um, standard kind of induced cancer assay for skin that causes these sort of warts or papillomas to appear, right, at a higher frequency. Um, and the bottom line is that when they apply this to these um, mice that are um, either the control mice or the NMR has two mice, um, which are the expression of the enzyme, um, over time, this is this TPA treatment, you have less numbers of papillomas relative to the controls. So again, um, showing that you have increased cancer resistance in these mice. Now, it's been noted that this is what happens in naked mole rats. They have increased cancer resistance. Nobody to this to date has been able to, um, I think this is the first paper where they've actually transferred this cross species, um, this very enzyme, and showed that that cancer resistance can be transferred, um, you know, just based on this one gene that controls um, the synthesis of high molecular mass, hyaluronic acid, from one species to another. Um, and later, later in this paper, they'll also show that it's not not this gene per se, not you know, not having that sequence and doing you know other things, but actually adding in the high molecular mass, hyaluronic acid to, um, I believe, an in vitro assay. Um, to other cells that, that it actually um, that it actually does, you know, that, that it's, the, it's the high molecular mass hyaluronic acid that's um, solely responsible for these effects. So it's, it's very interesting that you have this very, um, you know, pronounced effect from this one molecule or this one class of molecules that's uh, found um, natively in the naked mole rat. Um, that being said, um, Hyaluronic acid, in particular, high molecular mass hyaluronic acid, does do a number of different functions. So um, it'll probably be very challenging to figure out exactly what it is, um, you know, what component of the high molecular mass hyaluronic acid is actually doing this. Um, but suffice it to say, that's the molecule that's doing it. So any questions about this? That was figure one. Okay, on to figure two. It almost ended figure two because there's the lifespan curves. <laughs> um, so not only do they have increased cancer resistance, but they have extended lifespan and improved health span. So uh, what do they look at? Um, they look at just as a control body weight. That body weight doesn't change after expression of you know this um, high molecular mass hyaluronic acid through the induction of tamoxifen. They notice that there's differences between sexes as, for, for um, lifespan, as people have always noted, you know, females generally tend to live longer than males. This is a composite of male and female uh, lifespans. So the black line is the control, the red line is NMR HAS2. I think they mentioned it's a modest increase, something around roughly 10%. Um, it could be like a 15% increase in maximal and 9%. Um, uh, average, um, but they noted that I think the max, there was more maximal for the males and more average for the females, and I'm not sure exactly how to tease that apart. Yeah, Micah. Uh, it was a little late, so I apologize if this already answered. Are these uh, black six mice other than the... I believe so, yes. I believe they're yeah. C60, C57 black six mice. Yeah. Yeah. One comment is just that 120 weeks for black six is pretty short, like just as a baseline. I, mean, I think, um, like a good, you know, long-lived black six spouse is more like, I don't know, 150, 160 weeks, isn't it? I don't know. It's a good question. Um, anybody want to comment on that? I mean, are these uh, are these abnormally short-lived mice? Um, is I, don't, I mean, I think this is, this is common. Like I've seen plenty of black six mice that are on this age. It's just one of those things where, you know, a, a good lab can keep a black six mouse alive 
longer than many labs can keep a black six mouse alive. So it opens the question of, is this just counteracting the effects of poor environments? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, these are not just black six mice, but they also have this Cree recombinase system stuck right. in them. Um, these transgenic, um, I believe they're black six mice. Um, we could I'm, I'm guessing so. Yeah. It seems like a likely choice. Yeah. I said it, so I must have read it. <laughs> uh, unless I just made that made, made that strain background up for, the, for, the, for you know. Um, anyway. Um, well, also, the, the other comment is just that those survival curves, like, I mean, there's definitely, I mean, I, I, I trust the, the statistics here that is significant, but um, it just seems very mild at best. Like, those two curves are really close to each other. It, yeah. It's, it caused me to be not particularly excited about this. Like, I, I'm glad someone's doing the research. I think it's interesting, but the lifespan seemed not nearly what I was hoping for. Yeah. Well, one thing that I mentioned early in the paper um, that you might have missed is, is that there's a, there's a yin and a yang to this. So they, they express the um, HA2 gene, which is the hyaluronic acid synthase gene. Um, one thing is, I don't know what the difference is between like the kinetics of the HA2 gene from naked mole rat versus the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, what the enzyme velocity, you know, the, 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 the efficiency of HA2 genes in humans and, and, and mice. So I, maybe there's a good biochemical paper out there that does this, um, basically to, to attribute the, you know, the formation of high molecular mass, because I'm assuming if, if, if this gene is churning out high molecular mass versus low molecular mass, and these enzymes are very similar, then what's the difference? The only thing I can think of is that the rate of, rate of synthesis of hyaluronic acid, um, is more efficient, better, faster in this variant than it is, uh, you know, in, in other species. The other, the other kind of confounding thing is that they do mention that there's other classes of enzymes and that might be more active in mice and less active in naked mole rats called hyronidases, which, you know, um, conversely break down hyronic acid into shorter chains. So there might be some opportunity here to knock those down to see if, you know, if you can further skew this, because they do in the in the earlier figure, they show that um, they have, even though they have very robust messenger RNA expression, that's in the I think supplemental data. Um, it's 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 not as much high molecular mass HA being accumulated in mice as they expected, and then they speculate that it's these hyronidases that are active in breaking it down. So if that's the case, then there's ample room here to, to knock those down and see see whether or not you get an even more you know robust effect. That being said, they still see an effect, a significant effect on, on cancer inhibition. So may, maybe that, to answer your question, Micah, maybe that would bump up the survival in, in lifespan. Yeah, potentially. I mean, I think there, this is definitely a good starting point for additional further research. Yeah. So, um, so they do a lot of other things. So there's, there's the lifespan, but they also look at, you know, they also look at a whole panel slew of, of factors that are, you know, um, associated with inflammation. Um, and they also, so they do, they, they do a particular Horvath clock, methylation clock. Uh, it's mentioned in the paper here. Um, that's, that's scrunched down in figure C right there, which they show the age, you know, the, the, um, biologic age is reduced. Interestingly, um, the tissue that they use, they chose is liver. So this is a liver methylation clock. Um, but according to the text of the paper, man, there's like fires happening outside or something. There's like fire trucks kind of going around my corner. Every, apologize for that every 30 seconds. Um, but there's, um, uh, so liver, liver and spleen were the ones with the lowest expression or the lowest levels of high molecular mass, hyaluronic acid. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, if, if they would get an even better, better response, they would get an even better response, uh, you know, a, a, a better uh, decrease in um, biological age if they looked at tissues like uh, muscle, for example, that have much higher levels of hyaluronic acid, right? Like right here versus, um, Notably, uh, hyaluron, 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 it's one of these words that either I, I pronounce it right or I just get a tongue twister. Hyaluron, hyaluronin levels, I'll just say HA from there on. In the liver and spleen were very low, which is consistent with these tissues being the sites of 
HA breakdown. Notably, despite the high NMR H, uh, HAS RNA levels in most muscle organs, we observed only a mild increase in HA, probably due to high, as I mentioned, hyronidase activity in mouse tissues compared with the naked bull rat. So there's probably room there to, um, to explore that. And yes, that's what they used. C57 black six mice. Okay. Um, alrighty. So then they do, you know, they do a whole panel of these. Um, so regarding health span, you know, they look at various, they put these mice through, through various exercises, right? They, they give, there's a frailty index, latency to fall. So they got these mice hanging off some kind of rod that, you know, that uh, they try to hang on to and they can't, they fall. So they, I guess they time that four limb to grip strength. So there's some kind of strength assay here. Um, and then they, this is in females here, G. Um, I think they, they noted that, uh, so they looked at connectivity density. So improvement in density in various bones. And they noted that this was a more of a significant increase than in males. Um, I'm going to speculate here, maybe because males in general have maybe higher density or, you know, are less prone to osteoporosis than females. So maybe this assay is more, more, um, you know, uh, you know, can tease out the difference in female mice versus male mice. I'm, I'm just guessing on that. But um, regardless, uh, they seem to have improvements um, across the board in a number of these, you know, so better, better bone density in female mice. Frailty index goes down in old NMR HAS2 mice. Um, slight but significant improvements in latency to fall, right, and Orland grip strength. So better general health span for these mice. They're, they're more, you know, more resilient, more robust. So, um, and here we have, you know, here we have a whole bunch of genetic comparison panels that we'll look at figure three and four, which, you know, it's kind of hard to make out, you know, exactly, um, at least for me, when I, when I see a lot of, a lot of these Kind of differences you know you, you have a lot of gene differences when you look at you know female male so the genotype so this is um differentially expressed genes during aging uh so the grays here and the pastels i believe oh, right this is female so let me see here female ah, the gray is, is the controls the pastel pinks is the you know the um experiment um and then the dark gray in male is also control and then experiment is the, the overexpression of HAS2. Um, and well, you know, this is just the number of differentially expressed genes, right? So there is, there is a, in the liver, you have a, you know, a, well, I can't really, you know, it's not telling you which genes are being differentially expressed, but there is a, there is a difference in, in, in gene expression uh, profiles when you actually, you know, look at these mice that are overexpressing HAS2, um, which doesn't surprise me that you have this massive kind of perturbation in, in gene expression because um, hyaluronic acid is involved in intracellular signaling, right? So it's, you know, you're, 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 you're expressing this throughout tissues all over the place. So, um, you know, you get differential gene expression when you do a lot of things that impact every tissue you know, overheating the mice, um, feeding them different, you know, um, starving them, um, giving them rapamycin, doing all sorts of interventions, right? So you're going to have kind of changes in gene expression um, that either go up or down depending on, depending on the organ that you look at and depending on the gene that you look at. Um, and some of these, some of these expression profiles correlate, you know, there's some overlap with, um, with interventions like rapamycin. Um, but they note also in the paper that, uh, um, there's a lot of non, not non overlap with things like CR and rapamycin that tend to affect lifespan. So you'll, you'll have a lot of differential gene expression that doesn't overlap significantly with CR um, or, you know, growth hormone therapy or, or rapamycin. So, you know, I, I guess I could just sort of sum it up and say that, um, there's some overlap, but there's a lot of differences that are happening with overexpression of high molecular mass hyaluronic acid, um, 
and how those differences actually play into you know promoting the lifespan and the health span is still to be teased out so that's gonna that's gonna depend on which exact genes are being turned on or off which isn't exactly covered here in this figure as we can see and again hyaluronic acid you know could regulate a lot of things so it's it generally regulates a lot of signaling so signal molecules um, so I mentioned earlier so yeah the HA is playing the role but which particular signaling molecules are being most affected by this high, high molecular mass hyaluronic acid I think that's also an interesting question to ask and um, and I'm not sure how you can answer that right because you know I, th I think in textbooks they posit that um, Hyaluronic acid and other extracellular matrix factors, you know, tend to sequester signaling molecules, um, so they can signal themselves, but so they can sort of act as a sink, and, and those molecules can be released, kind of like a sponge. Kind of, I don't know how if that analogy is too crude, but maybe there's some way to basically extract this high molecular mass hyaluronic acid and do some sort of um, do some sort of, you know. Um, spectrographic assay to see what sort of molecules are sequestered in it and figure figure that out from you know work work backwards from a reductionist kind of angle to see see what the difference is there and maybe that account can account for some of the some of the alterations in expression profile um so what do they look at here so now they look at factors so pre er nmr has2 um so these are also i think just a different visualization of you know of gene expression uh and i'm not going to go really through this too much except to say that basically the transcriptome that they're looking at here is shifted towards that of a young mouse a younger mouse meaning that you have you know a decrease in genes that basically uh you know correlate with less influence inf less inflammation right so you know less less activity of genes that you know upregulate various various um lymphocytes for example that are correlated with 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 inflammation so leukocyte migration for example right if you get something stuck into you then you have white blood cells migrate to an area so so whatever these genes are um these levels basically go you know drop down uh, much more so that's basically what these panels are are showing um, and then they look at more specific factors that are in, in affected by inflammation um, so tumor necrosis factor IL-12b a beta um, MIP-1 alpha uh, some of these I think uh, which one some of them are actually positively uh, correlated is it MIP-1 beta well I'll get to that later um, oh I think IL-10 is is basically um, you know increased levels correlate with less inflammation. So essentially, what they're showing is that when they look at these are blood concentrations, I believe of these factors that are you know um, indicative of of inflammation and inflammation, there are lower levels in these um, older you know not in the young but certainly in the older. Um, Yeah, these older uh, naked mole rat um, NMR has to, so the gene from from naked mole rat. So lower levels of inflammation. Um, and what else do they look at? And less incidences of apoptosis in these mice. Um, that could be just mean that the mice are less stressed. So this is basically a fluorescence activated cell sorter. So they bin these cells based on staining for factors that you know could tell you if the cells are in late apoptosis or early apoptosis or necrotic dying in do other means right or live cells um, and they do an assay which i believe what do they do um add something that induces apoptosis i can't um i think it's a uh, i think they i think it's an some something that in, increases um oxidation of these cells J it's the assay that they use mm 
Where is J? Well, it's figure five, sorry. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Anyway, we'll find that later. But basically, they have reduced levels of apoptosis as well as um, reduced levels of, of, of inflammatory factors, right? So, um, any questions? They seem to be healthier. Okay. You have something in the chat here, right, Jay? Ah, okay. Ah, yes. The evolutionary effects on longevity. Which is kind of what we're doing to ourselves right now, right? We're living in a protective environment, getting food delivered to us, at least some of us are. Well, you say that in a joking manner, but there is actually a researcher, Mario. Mario's. Mario. Oh, I wasn't joking. Great, but yeah. uh, I, can't, I can't say his name. He's a, he's, I think he's a Greek or a Cypriot, um, but he argues the case that we don't need to do anything about aging necessarily, um, and in fact that nature will select for human longevity over the course of time due to this stable environment, um, which is, you know, it's, it's not an invalid point. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's probably not that inaccurate. I mean, nature's full of examples where super stable environments Create very long-lived species. It's, it's, you know that that happens. Um, so it's as crazy. you say about humans, uh, you know we mitigate the risks of nature with our heated houses, electricity, getting food delivered. We're not getting jumped by saber-toothed tigers. Eventually, nature may select for even more longevity. It's possible, but it doesn't really help us, does it? Cause it's going to take a while. Yeah, so there's a bit of a time issue there. It's going to take yeah. you know. People, hundred thousand years. <laughs> people forget that evolution works on populations, not individuals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, but that that was his his, his argument. Um, going back about ten years, I think he's still about. Um, I'm pretty sure he was giving a lecture. I think it's Marius or Maria, hmm. Mario, Marius. I think. Um, I'll have, to, I'll have to send it to you um, his his paper and see what you think. Um. You know, he's got a point, but I don't think we should uh, we should take that laissez-faire approach to uh, doing something about aging because that's not going to help us as individuals, right? Yep, yep, yep. It's a population thing, not an individual thing. So you know, you're you're not gonna, yeah, exactly. Not gonna help. Be, not gonna help any of us here in this room. This you need to <laughs> you need to channel the sequoia pine. Be the pine, Oliver. Be the pine in a super stable environment i'll settle for the pine tree i mean the palm tree in the background um wherever it is right now it looks very calming dda hello yeah hello uh, first uh, thank you for this uh, the explanation about this article like uh, somebody said uh, yeah the, it's really not very spectacular the difference between uh, mice uh, uh, with a genetic uh, difference and other mice, it's, it's really uh, not spectacular at all. And uh, this is, uh, of course, disappointing because, in my opinion, um, if enfin, when we will find something, it will be the chance that it will be with gene therapy is, is bigger than with other things. And here we have, uh, yeah, once again, we, we and, OK. We have uh, something that should be great and that give only uh, symbolic results. And like, uh, if I understand correctly, like uh, quite a few things uh, with new therapies, when you take a look at the results in the body, they are big. But when you take a, a look at the, uh, to the results in life uh, expectancy, they are small. So yeah, why is that? kind of a mystery, kind of a depressing mystery. And uh, I wanted to say concerning this uh, very stable uh, environments with very long lifespan, 
that's for me also one of uh, a kind of a mystery. So you have some uh, cave animals like salamanders. Uh, yeah, salamanders and some fish. So they uh, they are in very 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 stable environment. Uh, but yeah, they live longer. But they don't live so much longer. I think the maximum is about uh, one century for the salamanders. And for fish, I don't know if there are studies, but uh, probably not so much longer uh, neither. So there also, it's kind of a mystery to me uh, that uh, like if life expectancy, life uh, span can never exceed uh, one, two centuries. Well, there is the exception of a uh, Greenland shark, but uh, yeah, okay. It is an interesting exception, but not totally sure yet, I think, uh, because they calculate about uh, something with the eye, and it could be that there is a mistake there. Yeah, that's uh, the uh, comments. Um, but maybe uh, one now after the, the after the comments, maybe one question to you, Oliver. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I read that the I read that the difference was five percent, but I have the impression that it's even less. Um, I think it and, was. I think it was more than that. I think it it, it was a more pronounced effect. Uh, the, 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 but when you take yeah. a look at the Shima, it seems uh, yeah, there are no difference. Yeah, they they mentioned they mentioned well they mentioned that I think they mentioned somewhere in the text. I I didn't take a look at that figure that shows it, but that's a composite, the figure that we showed with both male and female, but I think there's a more pronounced, they, they mentioned it's a more pronounced average okay. lifespan effect for the females, but, yeah. but more, more, less, less so, or maybe not so much so for the males, okay. but, the, but the males had a longer um, max, maximal lifespan. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if, if there's a, if, if that's a real difference, but um, so I think yeah. the curves you're seeing there are basically a composite of both male and female. So that, okay. that yeah. Yeah, but you know, uh, yeah, to choose, to, to say, okay, it's better for males or females, it's kind of a cherry picking. And I suppose also this, this kind of uh, experiment is not blind. So it can be just the effect that uh, you hope that the animals are living uh, longer, and then you care a bit more with this, uh, with the, the treated animals, or s I, I don't know, or something. It can be anything, but uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it can, it can yeah. be anything. I would say outside of the genetic uh, effect. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Sat. yeah. I mean, Sat. There, Sat. There could it could be confounding variables. That's true. It's very hard to pick that apart. But that being said, I think they had like eighty or they had quite a few animals. Um, I the, yeah, and I the the um, and like I mentioned earlier, um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pan for gold here, and so to speak, and 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 suggest that maybe they'll get a more pronounced effect if they look at these a knockdown of these hyronidases. Um, because one thing they do mention at the beginning of the paper is that again, despite the expression of this NMR HA2 gene, they didn't have as much high molecular mass, hyronic acid in the tissues of the mice as they expected. So, okay. so if, 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 if that's the case, then they, there's a, they already suggested themselves what the room for improvement would be. So if that's the, if, if that is, if that is a hypothesis, then you would expect knocking down H, you know, hyronidases along with overexpression of, of, you know, of this um, NMR H, uh, HA2 gene should have an even better effect. Um, you know, maybe finally bumping up the numbers of the lifespan, you know, to something much more, um, much higher. So, you know, um, they already made this transgenic mouse. So it's, it's, uh, they could, they okay. could be another. <laughs> And if I may come back to comment my own comment, uh, you know, about uh, animals who live. So as far as I know, uh, there are no animals, even if very, in very stable environment, that live very long lives. But maybe one of the reasons uh, could be that 
Yeah, it seems to be perfectly stable, but maybe the parasites are changing, or maybe the you know new diseases yeah. and so on. Yeah, the it environment. The environment yeah. can be very complex. Like you mentioned before, yeah. um, I'm not an evolutionary biologist per se. So, you know, these limitations as to, for animals at least, right? So the Greenland shark living several hundreds of years, you know, I don't know. The environment could be pretty fickle, right? So there could be just some, no matter how stable of environment you think it, it is going to be, it's still Earth and all sorts of catastrophic events are happening. And yeah. so... You know, and there and there's and and there's always there's always, you know, looking at these various competing theories of aging like antagonistic pleiotropy, certainly something that something that's gonna promote longevity, but it's gonna repress your reproductive fitness because it's gonna make you slower somehow is is gonna play against that, depending on, on what environmental catastrophe or peculiarity arises. So I think it's just this so many variables that are being thrown at organisms that um, you know you can kind of generalize and say, yeah, in a in a in a safer environment where you push you you know push the um, you know make it more easier for older organisms to reproduce, then you're going to shift obviously the average lifespan and you're going to shift the longevity as people have demonstrated, like Michael Rose with fruit flies, for example, the, the breeding program, yeah. yeah. The name that you were saying, so uh, it's this name probably that you were looking for, no? Marios Kiriazis. No? I don't know. That's directed for Steve Marios Kiriazis. Maybe that's that's the name. Because uh, yeah, yep. he's he not important, but he's not from Greece, but from Cyprus. Yeah. Close. Yeah, I did. I, I said he was either a Greek or a Cypriot. So. Can I come from on? Cyprus? Yeah, a Cypriot. <laughs> Can I come in on this point? Yep. This, this is this. What, what I've always wondered about the naked walrat, which obviously is unique in having a non gompert style mortality curve, is to what extent the, the intermittent hypoxia has a, a material impact on um, lifespan, lifespan, because basically with the intermittent hypoxia and the variation in the partial pressure of oxygen in the mitochondria that naked mole rats tend to encounter, um, you'll get HIF-1 alpha kicking off and encouraging autophagy and in improving mitochondrial quality. Oh. Um, and you wonder sometimes if the bowhead whale has a similar sort of environmental benefit. Um, but I, that's, So it's completely different to questions relating to hyaluronic acid. Well, maybe, maybe not. How, what's the what's the gas permeability of high molecular mass hyaluronic acid? Uh, you know, O2. Well, I wouldn't think it, it's it's. You would assume that it's the it's the same old same old, which is going to be the partial pressure of oxygen uh, at the mitochondria, which obviously is is a lot lower than you get in the lungs. Mm -hmm. um, but this is this is the H bot saga. You know, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It's actually when you study the papers. You find that it's the um, intermittent reduction in partial pressure of oxygen in the mitochondria that stimulates HIF1 alpha, and, and that that's you know exercise stimulates HIF1. A lot of things, a lot of hormesis things, operate through HIF1 alpha, and um, obviously that's a completely different tree to be up barking up compared to hyaluronic acid. Um, I don't know. What? Maybe room for for a multi multi transgenic mouse to see if we can really boost levels of, of lifespan. Yeah, well, that's um, the environment you see because they go in tunnels and the tunnels are often very short of oxygen. I don't know to what extent the um, those in captivity are kept mm. in similar environments, but uh, it's it's actually that they breathe less than twenty one percent oxygen. That's interesting. I yeah. I again, I don't know anything about this, so I I'm, I'm assuming that. They keep naked mole rats in like a regular mouse box. They don't provide them with adequate no. tunneling, no. and and I'm and I'm just wondering if that if that would have an effect on on their on That's their. That's a good question, question to which yeah. I don't know the answer. Yeah. Basically, how do they look after that? Do they give their naked mole rats nice tunnels, or do they just put them in a box? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't I mean, know the answer. I mean, I mean, the, the 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 simplest way to reproduce this is obviously measure the oxygen and various atmospheric gas levels in 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 situ wherever you just find find a you know go out in the wild find a naked mole rat tunnel 
fill, fill but it we know the tunnel. No, we do know that the tunnels themselves are, are hypoxic. Oh well, then you can the you issue, can make a make a box which basically the regulates the, the gap. Yeah. Kept in captivity actually have a similar environment or not? Well, I mean that's an, that's an easy question know. to answer. If, if, it, if it's in yeah, a regular mouse, if it's a, yeah. uh, they have tunnels in the ones kept at Moscow University. Steve Hill says, okay, well, interesting. But is it okay. tunnel? Is it tunnels just kind of like cardboard tunnels for them to play in, or is it actual right. like, or is it the, or is the key difference here like? I would, I would assume it's not the tunnels per se, but having them in a plexiglass box that mimics the, the atmospheric conditions that they're really oh, in. So that you right. can't get oxygen through the tunnel. It doesn't, you, you yeah, know, yeah, like basically, right. About they, yeah, so, the so, yeah, so do, do these things need to be kept in like the equivalent of a tissue culture incubator, <clears throat> basically? Well, it's, it, no, it's the question is really one of to what extent they, they still have the intermittent hypoxia, which like the bowhead whale has issues of hypoxia as well. Mm. Um, and there's no there's no question about it, that, it, that stirring up HIF-1 alpha is a good thing, because mm. it does lots of things. Um, but, but um, Yeah, a lot of things, variables to keep in mind when you're performing experiments. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, well, just thought I'd raise that point anyway. It's a good point. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me... Go back to sharing the screen here. I think we have one or two more figures to go. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so um, so less inflammaging, more cancer resistance, and also mice. These NMR HAS2 mice are protected from age-related loss of gut barrier function. Um, so what do they look at here? Um, so they do an assay, which I basically test for leaky gut. Um, so what did they, they have some sort of, uh, fluorescent, um, some sort of fluorescent compound that I guess is, um, given to mice and then they see if it's found in, found in the blood, uh, can't remember the exact, um, it's not in the figure, they just mention it, um, it's in the materials and methods, um, so FITC is a fluorescent type, you know, it's a fluorescent molecule, it must be conjugated to something, so they use that as a, as a, you know, as a measure for gut permeability, which these older NMR has two mice have improved. Um, they also note, I think what else do they note here? Um, so they look at um, goblet cells. So these are cells that produce mucus in the, you know, in the gut and obviously have a protective role. Um, MUC2 stains for them. So uh, old, young, um, so, uh, let's see how much of a significant difference is that, you know, is that a much more higher, it's not significant between young NMRS2 or, so old pre-ER and old NMR, so a much, uh, much higher, uh, much higher level of these, you know, goblet cells, so they have higher mucus levels production. I think they measure this both in number of cells per villus, uh, because vill villi are the, you know, provide higher surface area, and also number of goblet cells per crypt, uh, which are the bottoms of the villi. That's where you have cells being produced. Um, they do mention, oh, and I believe they have higher levels of, do they have higher levels? They don't have higher levels. So there's also these panath cells, which produce a variety of antimicrobial compounds. Um, I forget what the significance of this was. I think they mentioned here that lower levels means that there's probably less antimicrobial compounds being produced because the gut, gut is healthier. So that's some, somewhat of a paradox here. Um, but essentially, what they're demonstrating here is that you have essentially less leaky gut in these in these older mice that have NMR has to. Um, and finally, what they look at is um, so they do this assay to look at maintenance of um, intestinal stem cells uh, and they do a variety of assays here so I think LGR5 is a marker for intestinal stem cells they don't have more intestinal stem cells per crypt so the crypt is the area of kind of the bottom of the villus where you have intestinal stem cells where you have differentiation taking place um, relative has two expression, well, of course, has two levels are, are higher in, in these areas. Um, but what they do note 
is that these stem cells um, are better equipped uh, to differentiate. So they have this assay here uh, where they um, isolate these cells and try to get them to induce organoids in, uh, in vitro. And organoids are basically um, well, like a kind of a micro version, miniature version of, of, of an organ. Um, so, you know, you sort of, I don't want to call it a, sort of like a teratoma. It's not teratoma, but it, it basically like, you know, you, you have a, you have a three dimensional glob of cells that is differentiated, right? So you have, you don't just have like one bulb undifferentiated cells, but it, it, it turns into kind of a, you know, a simulation of a cross section of the particular organ, in this case, an intestine. So you'll have differentiated goblet cells and panet cells and, and, and the interior of this ball is like equivalent to the lumen of the interior of, of the, um, of the intestine. So what they do is, uh, what they notice is that um, you get much more organate formation um, when you take these, you know, isolate these uh, crypts, do this in vitro, um, induce them somehow, uh, and the older NMR has to expressing cells have significantly better capability of forming organoids, suggesting that, suggesting that um, their intestinal stem cells are, um, well, better able to differentiate into, into additional cells. Um, you can do more work on this to kind of, you know, tease this out and see if these effects also apply to other um, organs, because again, they're just looking at intestinal stem cells. Um, and as we've noted before, you, you also have higher expression levels in the muscle, um, other regions, you know, of the, of the mouse. Um, and does this translate to better stem cell activity in other tissues as well? Um, that I'm not sure. Um, but that is basically it. That is the kind of the summary. This, you know, this figure here summarizes what's happening. You have, you know, um, improved gut barrier function, um, you know, less activation of immune cells, so less inflammation. Um, oxidative stress reduces, you know, the, you know, cells from undergoing premature apoptosis. Um, and this is all attributed to um, the expression of this NMR HA2 gene and the concomitant prediction of high molecular mass HA. Although, like I mentioned before, um, we could we could see we could do we we could set up the system. They, you know, future experiments could set up the system where actually higher levels of high molecular mass um, HA are produced because of these confounding you know effects of these hyronidases in 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 mice. So I think there's a room here for like a version two of this and to see if we get even much more robust effects. And um, yeah, that's a, that's a question that, that, that I could ask. I might be actually meeting with um, Vadim Gladyshev tomorrow on an unrelated meeting, uh, um, well, related meeting, right, to mouth, mouse lifespan. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you got to ask him to see if there's any, if there's a follow-up to, the, to these experiments that are being performed. Um, or maybe that's a question best directed towards Vera Gorbanova, who is um, no doubt focusing on the actual um, actual work with the uh, naked mole rat. All right, come in again. Yeah. Uh, the, the experiment I would obviously like to see done on naked mole rats rather than, rather than transgenic mice is whether if they're not in tunnels, they die earlier. Because if, they're, if the intermittent hypoxia is a key thing in their, their extended lifespan, then obviously, if they are not living in their normal circumstances and they're just in a constant normoxia of about 21%, they'd probably die earlier. Um, and that'd be an interesting question to work out whether actually it, it is a factor that's important to them. But if they um, do live a long time, though, you see, yeah. that's a hard test to do. Yeah, well, if this hypothesis is, is you know, if, if it's all, it's, a lot of this is happening due to high molecular mass ironic acid. How easy it is to generate a transgenic naked mole rat and just add in, knock out this gene function. Just knock out the tunnels. Well, yeah. What oh. happens if you make it mole rat <laughs> if they're not living in tunnels? That's a good question, isn't it? You know, it's sort of like, yeah. is, is it the, the hypoxia 
intermittent hypoxia that causes them to um, live a lot longer. And actually, you see, this is the this is this whole thing about Gompert. Uh, I I have this view on Gompert, which is implies a sort of a standard system. And if it is mitochondrial efficiency that's driving a lot of that, and you get HIF one alpha kicking off all the time, sorting out autophagy and things like that, then um, no wonder they last a long time. Mm. There's one of my animal experiments wandering behind me. Come on, yeah. he wants to be fed. <laughs> yeah. Cute. Okay. Um, well, um, I think that's a wrap for this paper. Um, yeah. I I enjoyed the direction that this went, and I am I am intrigued by by the, you know, um. Uh, by the room for kind of the room for improvement here that the authors themselves have suggested. Um, I'm probably going to do a little bit of looking up on my own on kind of the hyronidase and the, and the, you know, the hyronic acid synthase genes themselves. And just, just to see like, if there's any like biochemistry papers out there that have looked at kind of a comparative analysis enzymatically between the two. Um, because that the authors seem to suggest that, in this paper, right? So, is is there something fundamentally better um, enzymatically with this version of the gene, or is it more attributed to the higher levels of, you know, um, of hyronidases in mice, or is it both a combination? I don't know. Um, so, I, I think you know, I think there's certainly certainly if this hypothesis is correct, then we can certainly improve this by by um, by addressing this in, a, in another transgenic mouse. I am pretty sure that the um, naked mole rats are raised in colonies um, dug in, into tunnels. Uh, they, they have a queen structure, and uh, I don't think that they would survive in individual cages. I think their whole society depends on them being in a tunnel together. Hmm. I just remember but someone. My, my own view is that that's much more likely to be mechanistically a reason for an extended lifestyle, because basically it, it stirs up the high, you know hyperoxygenal factor one alpha, which is a key driver. You know when you look at exercise, exercise kicks that up. Most of the hormetic things operate through HIF one alpha, and if you look, you know the, the the thing to understand about it, which is often not obvious, but it's in the papers is it's a variation in the partial pressure of oxygen. So that can happen in a number of ways. It can happen by taking normal levels and going down to say 15%. But in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, it's you, you take the partial pressure up say to 42% and drive it back down to 21%. And that, that's the sort of thing that um, that stirs up HIF1 alpha and does all the work from that. So I think that's, that's a much better area for looking at, but still. I, I'm, I'm not making decisions on research funding. I fund my own research, but so 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 uh, I can so, fund, them, but I don't. So are you suggesting, John, that we should return to cavemen and go spelunking more often? Is that no, no, no? I'm That's suggesting that it's a variation in the partial. There's lots of ways of doing it. People do it by sitting in a big box and putting the pressure up, and then they take the pressure down. And obviously, as you take the pressure up to two bars, you double the partial pressure. Of oxygen, it's actually the partial pressure as it comes into the mitochondria, which is quite an interesting bit of physics. Um, and and I, the, you know that that I think is is the thing to look at. Now, I, I'm not a fan myself of going down below 21 percent. I'd rather just take it up and drop it back down again. Um, but but obviously you can do, it, but it it can cause all sorts of damage. So it doesn't necessarily the, the mole rats who probably have adjusted to it. But this issue about them being in tunnels. If they're always in tunnels, then we're not actually we're 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 we're, in, we're continuing to you know you could put other mice in tunnels and send them in and out of hypoxia and see what happens or whatever. Mm. But, um, I don't, there's a lot of research done on on here, so I don't I don't think there's any uncertainty there at all. And it's very interesting. I. It, it, I have written the page looking at the various comparisons between different bits of work on intermittent hypoxia. Uh, and it's quite interesting if you ever want to talk at length about it. I can go on for hours. Hmm. Interesting.
How does that compare with intermittent fasting when it comes to health? Well, obviously, yeah. intermittent fasting is a different ball game. Although yeah. intermittent fasting, I'm actually sort of having one of those today in a sense. Um, and so perhaps I'm on a bit on edge as a result. Intermittent, the idea of intermittent fasting is, is, is that you are sort of switching mTOR off, so it encourages autophagy. But HIF1-alpha, I think, is a much more basic route um, towards encouraging autophagy. So, the, you know, it's, it, but exercise, if you look at hormesis, it tends to operate through, and a lot of it uh, is, you know, all the ROS stuff. It's, it's, it's actually the ROS signaling that comes and stirs up HIF1-alpha. It's, it's quite interesting, but, but quite complex as well. Although in some senses it isn't, the partial pressure of oxygen at the mitochondria. Well, perhaps we'll find, maybe there'll be a paper coming out soon that I don't know. I, 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 wrote, I wrote a web page about it, which you're welcome to look at. But, right. um, it's on, on my blog, but I've got all my bits and bobs on my blog. And my, pa my patents should publish soon. I get a patent out in oh. on the patent conversion treaty, and it publishes in October. I'm always happy to talk about these things. All right. Well, when it comes out and you've got your patent locked in, um, we... Well, no, this is the pa do you understand how international patent law works? No, I don't. <laughs> well, what it is, is you do, do a domestic application, yeah. and then you do an international application to get precedence in terms of dates, okay. and then you have to make the domestic applications again. So basically, I have until about October next year to decide what jurisdictions to apply for actual domestic patent in, and then I, but it will publish in October, because okay. it's a year, after I, a year and a half, actually, after I originally applied for it. All right. Quite interesting. Anybody have any other questions about this article or anything related to the article? I think, uh, I think we've covered, well, there's a lot more to cover on the naked mole rat, but I think as far as, as far as the, the questions regarding the efficacy of high molecular weight, hyaluronic acid, um, certainly promising, certainly does work in naked mole rats, but I think, uh, you know, there's, more room here to improve, which is a good thing. And I think the paper has actually suggested a, a further um, slew of experiments that could be done. And I'd be surprised if they didn't go forward and do them. They're probably already planning them as we speak. The mole people are here. Yeah. They're, they're, they're among yes. us. <laughs> but well, I mean, Jules, it's Jules Verne, isn't it, really? Having yeah. Mole people. <sighs> Okay, so well. yes, the long-lived uh, uh, mole people, uh, mole rat people in this case, uh, that could be yeah. our future. Um, interesting that I, I, th I think it's interesting that longevity mechanisms can be transferred between species. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done here, but I, I do find it fascinating uh, nonetheless. So uh, I'm not sure as I'd, I'd want to do it to myself just yet, but... Uh, I think this might be the second paper that we've looked at, which actually takes a compound that's found in, well, this is trans species, but we looked at some other metabolites that are associated with health span and were basically synthesized and introduced. I forgot what, which compounds they were. Um, and basically not, usually you look for compounds in plants or somewhere, somewhere out there, but, but basically with it, within a species or closely related species and were transferred and, um, these were these were metabolites. Um, I think the hyaluronic, the high molecular weight hyaluronic mass, high high molecular mass HA, <laughs> falls into this category of biologics that that um, that could have a you know that potentially might have a profound longevity effect. Um, and it'd be interesting to see how these all these com compounds work kind of in a in a combination sense, right? So clearly. When they when they looked at uh, the gene profile analysis, you, you did have significantly different gene profile and that, you know um, patterns with the overexpression of high molecular mass HA versus rapamycin versus calorie restriction. So so that suggests to me that multiple interventions might be complementary um, and might might actually have an additive effect. Perhaps you guys and your okay. synergy. Yes. Is it the researchers, you love synergy. Yeah, synergy, that's our favorite think, buzzword. I think synergy does exist, but you have to work out the mechanism first. Yeah. Just, well, I can talk to you about that as well. But. 
just toss that word around in lecture synergy synergy just mentioned yeah it depends whether they, whether people whether things are operating to, to support the same mechanistic approach or whether they're contrary on the mechanism and the cycling as well cycling is something i think people ignore yeah synergy is one of those words that can be used too much in a hand wavy sense along with with terminology yeah, like it was the methodology yeah. if you don't know the methodology you don't know whether it's going to be synergistic or not words that are overused in research uh, novel um that was empirically determined i like that one yeah. yeah, novel. Whenever I see novel in a uh, journal paper, I'm like, mm-hmm. Well, it goes without saying, because if it wasn't a novel, it wouldn't be able to be published, now, would it? <laughs> Our approach is, uh, we demonstrate a novel approach. Well, it's not, no, you didn't, because somebody's already done that. It's based on the research. It's not novel at all. It's just a... Uh, uh, <laughs> novel bits, so though. That's the thing. It cannot be novel. Right, we're it gonna, can be, but I just okay. I, 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 I do something. Think what pattern was all about? It has to be novel. Okay, we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna end the year's journal clubs with a top ten list of overused terms, hype terms in science. So well, empirically yeah, determined, yeah. novel, yeah. synergistic. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll make a list. <laughs> Synergist, syner, synergy is, is, is if if you identify different things oh, which have a synergistic effect that's worthwhile oh it's real but it, it can be overused mm -hmm. people with oh, of course it's overused <laughs> because people are trying to get research funding yeah. so they're going to use the word yeah he's got it in one it's exactly yeah, what it is it, it, it's like you can't it's blame like people for being they've got they've got you know this is the problem a lot of it the difficulty is that you know you, you need funding for research so you're going to go about it in a way that's more likely to get the funding and you're going to have non novel synergistic empirical solutions to um everything yeah you've got the kind of similar situation to what you've got in journalism oliver it's um everything's about selling papers or magazines or getting clicks so a lot of journalists and outlets they fall prey to that because well without that they can't continue so they do tend to sort of um air towards what we call yellow journalism so maybe there's a sort of yellow researching phenomena happening as well where people are over sensationalizing to get the get the grants. I eventually, don't know. Eventually, everything is going to be explosive and breaking. Oh yeah, yeah groundbreak, groundbreaking. The hard thing for researchers is to get funding for speculative research, where you don't know whether it's going to work or not. Yeah. yeah. Because when the when you talk to the funders, the funders say, "Well, are we going to get results from this?" And they, negative results are actually quite helpful. Yeah, uh, but getting the funding. So that's why what everything tends to be trendy, and the, the most recent fashion gets a lot of funding, and other things don't. Yeah, I mean that that sort of sort of goes into what uh, Irina Conboy and I talked about as well uh, in an interview I did uh, earlier this year. We were speaking about the the pitfalls of journalism and 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 uh, running a journal, and we, mm. we we definitely touched upon those uh, those things. So there is, um, there's all sorts of weird things like in, uh, impact ratings that are not yeah, really no, no, no. A, a great way of doing yeah. things. But you know, we, we Oliver, we could probably do an entire journal club uh, about the journal system yeah. and why it's broken and. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I want to be a little bit more. You, I, I, th I think, I think, I think that's people have been. That's been written about to death. There's nothing new I can add to this. Um, that's all I can say. And we, we we all know what the problems are. We all know what the potential solutions are. And and it's usually, yeah. And 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 the huge barriers. And um, yeah, 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 yeah. You've got yeah. to be part of the solution, Oliver. Otherwise, you're part of the problem. I am part of the solution. I illegally download stuff all the time. No, I'm just <laughs> What? <laughs> things like that on a live stream, Oliver. <laughs> I thought we were off. Okay. Anyway, um, honestly, guys, yeah, no, we've got it. probably still being recorded. So. That was a joke. <laughs> that was a joke. Bit, yeah. I think, I think, I think satire is permitted. It's, it's. it's... We, 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 we definitely do have institutional uh, accounts with with a number of journals. Uh, please don't sue us, uh, Elsevier. <laughs> but we, we've definitely got, we, we definitely got subscriptions. Uh, if, for us as uh, an organization, a nonprofit, it, it's absolutely essential uh, that, w that we do have access. Otherwise, we can't write about and I work, papers. I, we can't do anything without I, it. I, I work in an institution. so Yeah, um, so we're, we're basically propping up the institution by having subscriptions. But it's the only way to do it at the moment. Give me an alternative. Um, anyway, on, 
on that note, I suppose we will bid you all adieu. Okay. And thanks for everybody who's joined us Take today. Care. Thanks for I would hang around. Bye -bye, everybody. Everybody. I, I would hang around, but I, I've got to meet me a student and sign some forms, so I got to run. Take care, everybody. I'll see you at the end of this month yet again. So we'll, we'll, yes, we'll meet each it's other. A do, it's a double Bye. dip in this time. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.